Um, my name is Liz Turner. I'm a DKG member from Virginia State Organization. And um, Beverly Johns and Carol Linskin and I have kind of formed this group of just wanting to do this. And I wanted to take a few minutes just to go over a few engagement guidelines uh, for Zoom. I know that all of you probably, you know, have heard them over and over again, but just they're worth repeating. Just if you're not speaking, if you could just mute your mic so we could make sure that we don't have any background noise infiltrating uh, or, you know, anything else that goes on, you know, that may be unexpected that we don't want to hear, you know, <laughs> outside. Sometimes the dog's barking here uh, as such. And also, you know, uh, please feel free to stay on camera as you wish. You know, there'll be a time at the end where we want everybody on camera in so we can take a gallery shot of each. I think we have three or four screens uh, going on now uh, with the number of participants uh, that we have. And of course, always engage in chat. You know, that's the um, so an advantage and disadvantage. We can save your comments and the disadvantages. Sometimes it's nice to, you know, kind of, you know, connect in person and chat with that person, but we do save all your notes and your comments and your ideas. So please continue to um, share them in chat. We won't send you all the chat, but we'll lift out the, you know, important ideas and things that you say, you know, resources, websites, anything that you want to post. Absolutely. So um, just to get us started, I want to kind of give you just a quick little one or two minute story of how this this uh, originate. I see a hand up. Uh, Delia, do you have your a question? I'm sorry, Delia. I can't. Uh, you're on mute. Um, just write your question in chat if you have it. Okay. Thank you. So anyhow, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, what was the genesis of this. So. A couple of weeks ago, believe it, it's just been two weeks, we attended a meeting of the Virtual Teachers Lounge, you know, and three of the, um, you know, founders are with us today. They're from the DC organization, uh, Karen Gross, Sakina Magruder, and Pat Neal. And we talked about the aftermath and what was going on and what was DKG, you know, different the states, the chapters doing. And so out of that meeting, you know, emerged this supporting statement from the Virtual Teachers Lounge, most of which uh, we have to give kind of credit to Sakina, who was giving her perspective as a classroom teacher, and also who will give it today. And just, you know, if you want to I'll read it, read along with me here, or, you know, follow along. So, the, and we published this on the DKG International Public Facebook page, uh, the one for, you know, the um, public group of, of members here. Um, so we find it hard to fathom that yet another school shooting has happened. Words of sympathy and concern, however well-meaning and heartfelt, are not enough. It is time to make all schools safe for students, for educators, for parents, for caregivers. We need more than rhetoric. We need action steps. We can't accept that when this new cycle ends, the issue of school safety will go away yet again. Instead, let's work together to make change now and for all of our children. And so we talked about it and, and we were talking and we looked up all the March Fair lives you know, today. And we said, well, some people may not be near one and some people may not, you know, be uh, able to attend one. So out of that, like, let's do a virtual march. And so in the two weeks, that's how this started. So we put out a save the date, you know, to emails, you know, all our email networks um, on our Facebook page. You know, we had the date. We didn't really have any speakers yet except Karen and Sakina. And these were the topics we discussed, that trauma generated by the Evaldi shooting, creating safe school environments, perspectives of the classroom teacher. And we view it as such a call to action and statements of support, advocacy and action, and at the same time, keeping it very nonpartisan. So with that, we had outreach and we said, let's invite some speakers. It was just based on, you know, uh, not denying anybody the right, but sort of like engaging people we knew who were already working on these things. And there you see the list of speakers that we had uh, 
you know, ask and I'll accept it. Even um, we asked um, through Carrie Fry, who's here, Gwen Graham, Assistant Secretary of Education, who's a Florida honorary member. So you will be hearing from them. So with that, um, we have asked the speakers to speak no more than five minutes. And at a time, if you made a sign, and thank you for all your signs, we're going to make a collage of them afterwards and maybe show them throughout. You want to keep this very much like a march. You know, when I've gone to marches, it's just very spontaneous. You know, you can clap if you want after speakers. You can raise your hand. You can do reactions. Anything um, that you would like to do to, to celebrate our coming together uh, in this very important um, call for action. So at the end, if you have any action state that you're taking in your state, your chapter along the way, just chat them and chat and we'll collect those and organize them and send them out. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Carolyn Scott um, just for a couple of minutes to share kind of about our uh, audience here today. Thank you, Liz. I'm Carolyn Scott, Seattle, Washington, Alpha Sigma Kitsap chapter. We have 127 folks registered for this virtual march, representing five countries, Canada, Costa Rica, Mexico, Turkey, and the US. We have 29 states represented from the US and two from Mexico. So very exciting. We're also covering about 10 different time zones. Welcome to those folks from Hawaii who woke up so early today and uh, from Turkey who are staying up late. <laughs> and everyone else has come to join us today. Thank you. And mm -hmm. Bev. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to see all of you here. Uh, the emotions we have felt have been, we've been shocked, we've been heartbroken, and we have been angry. Innocent children and teachers lost their lives in what should have been the safety and security of their school. We can no longer become desensitized to violence. We have to be able to look for warning signs. We have to improve our mental health system. We have to model and teach appropriate social social and coping skills. We must all do our part to stop the violence. Let's work together. Our children and educators deserve all we can do. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Liz who will introduce Karen Gross. Well, it is my delight to have our first speaker our kickoff speaker, our setting the stage speaker of Dr. Karen Gross. Karen Gross is an award-winning educator, author, and artist. She specializes in trauma and its impact on student success and psychosocial development. She's a former college president and senior policy advisor to the U.S. Department of Education. She has written 12 trauma-sensitive books for children two books for educators and policymakers on creating trauma responsive institutions. And you may remember one of her books uh, received the Educators Award, the DKG Educators Award. And she is a DKG member and uh, 2020, I think it was. And she teaches at the Rutgers School of Social Work. So thank you, Karen, and it's over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My apologies for my voice. This is not an effort to sound like Marlena Dietrich. Um, I want to thank Liz and Bev and Carol for making this happen. I think it's hugely important that DKG is doing this. It speaks volumes. And I'm pleased to see so many of you here and I'm sure others will join over the course of the afternoon. Um, the topic to which I was assigned is the trauma of the Uvalde shooting. And that title seems almost too obvious. But I wanna share a recent experience with all of you. 
to show the complexity of the trauma that we face. So go with me here. There is a company in Georgia that makes mini caskets that are for deceased children. They sent 19 of them to Uvalde where an artist named Trey Ganim and his son met with each family so that they could decorate and personalize each casket. There were Superman figures, there were hikers, there were butterflies, there was softball, there were ninja turtles. And the caskets are stunning. And many people online have admired the art and thanked the artists. I did that too. But I can't help but ask, why do we need 19 caskets for 19 children killed at an elementary school? Why aren't we saying no more? and doing something to make that happen. Now, we said no more after Sandy Hook. We said no more after Parkland. But what we have said has not come to pass. And here we are again, being in school. Now, the current shootings are surely traumatic. And they activate earlier shootings, which are then traumatic. And they activate other shootings and deaths, and that is traumatic. But there is an added trauma in this reality. It is the trauma of worrying about, will this happen again? We worry that words won't produce action we worry about our own safety and that of our children. We worry about death and former safe places now being unsafe. And that uncertainty is deeply traumatizing. And it leaves us asking who will be next? And so our trauma runs deep and wide and seems ready to strike again at any minute. So now what? Do we just struggle with our trauma? There are no easy answers. There is no simple solution. There is no one pathway forward. There is no pending miracle. Despite all that, I have hope. And our children need to see that hope in us. They need to know that they are safe and that we're striving to make the world safer. And so we march to message. We march to see that we're not alone. We march to show our children that we are taking a stand. I wanted to share with you a sign from the 2017 Women's March. And as you can see, it says, I'm marching for you and for all children around the globe. And so my message to you is, yes, this is deeply traumatic, but our children need to know that we're working on addressing these issues with action and our marching, our marching, whether virtually or in reality, is one crucial first step. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Okay. I, I, um, yeah, go ahead. Do we have any questions for Karen? Yeah. 
Um, please share comments also. I see Daphne has shared a comment, you know, four years ago at the Parkland inspired first March for Our Lives, I stood in the crown with a sign that read a California teacher says never again. How many school shootings that, since then? And again, we will share all our, our comments. I wish we could go around to all, you know, 50, 60, but thank you, Karen. It's certainly a call to action that you have sent all of us and the theme for the day. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carol Lynn Scott, who is going to introduce our second speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Sakina Magruder. Sakina is a national board certified teacher with over 18 years of teaching experience. She teaches kindergarten in a Title I school in Maryland while mentoring teachers, including those struggling with classroom management. She is currently pursuing her doctorate in organizational leadership, K-12, at Grand Union University. In her free time, Sakina enjoys crafting with her daughter, creating stations for her classroom, and going to the movies with her family. Knowing Kasina, or Sakina, I, excuse me, I really just want to come and spend most of my time in your classroom or go back to being a kindergartner with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm seem to be having all of a sudden some computer issues, so I apologize in advance. Um, I am excited to be here today and also sad um, in bold the sense. Sad, uh, so thank you to the people who organized the virtual march because it's necessary and needed, but I'm sad that we are actually marching and having to, to talk about this. Um, I just often reflect about my childhood and the joy of being in school and how this was the last thing that I feel like I ever had to worry about was like guns and violence in school. You know, if anything, we often even had fire drills when I was little and we saw it as a chance to get out of school and have a break, you know, and then regroup and go back into the building. But now it's different times as an educator. Um, I would say the state of our education right now, one word, fear. There's no other words. The word is fear. Teachers are fearful. The students are afraid. And I even believe that our administrators are afraid. Um, and how do you correct that? Um, what do you do? When um, Texas shooting happened, um, it was a difficult day for us because we also had a student who was terrorizing our school as well. He was ripping down bulletin boards and throwing chairs. Um, and I think that he also had a reaction to everything that was happening. And um, so it was just a really hard day um, in general. And the very next day we were told, or that evening we were told in the email to not discuss what happened with our classes. I don't agree with that. I don't think that as a society, we can continue to not have these challenging conversations. You know, the kids are thinking about it. They're afraid about it. How is it that we can go on acting like nothing happened? Um, and I understand that, you know, our state as school teachers and in education, we can't, you know, there's rules and boundaries, but I do believe that there needs to be a conversation that's had to reassure the students that they are safe and that, you know, we are prepared in the event we practice. They need that in order for them to function. I mean, just think about it. Um, the other day, I'll give you a prime example. I think it was Thursday. I was um, teaching in the middle of my lesson. And I think, I know the students saw me, but I saw somebody walking um, on the back side of our school. And there's lots of windows near my classroom. And I try as casual as I could to keep my lesson going. But I also knew that I needed to find out who that was that was walking behind the school. I could see that it was just a contractor, but I felt as a teacher, maybe they need to let us know that contractors were gonna be at our school working on the roof um, because they're carrying all these um, tools. Um, it, just, it just was alarming. But then when I peeked and peered through the window and saw that it was him and, he, and, and I kind of relaxed, I turned around and I could see the look of fear on my student's face. 
So I had to reassure them what my job was. And I said, I always say to my class, what's my job? And they say, to keep us safe. I said, again, just, just me doing my job, boys and girls, no worries, no alarms, nothing to worry about. Um, and that's kind of the environment that we're in right now. Um, the kids are always worried about what's gonna happen next. Is there a bad guy coming to our classroom and things of that nature. Um, I also have a daughter. So I wanna tell you guys that I don't want her to operate in fear, although she is afraid. I had that difficult conversation with her after Texas and I said to her, you know, let's really talk about what's happening. You know, what would you do in the event of this happening? You know, do you know what to do? I feel like we can't avoid that. And I'm also at the other point in my teaching career where I feel like all the lawmakers have to stop talking and take action. We are the ones who need to talk, but they need to take action. Change is needed and it's needed now because everybody is dealing with this state of fear. And that's not to me very productive. How do you expect our students to perform and be awesome at what it is we're expecting them to do when they're living in a state of fear? I don't think anybody could learn under those conditions. So I just feel like a change is needed and it's needed to help reassure our students that everything's gonna be okay. Be it change in security, be it, you know, even having um, assemblies or whatever of that nature that's gonna help calm their fears, it's needed. Um, I, I personally, I have a big mouth. I tell everybody I'm the rebel because I'm not afraid to talk. And I feel like at the end of the year, I'm going to sit down with my principal who's had a very tough year. And I know it has because we came back from COVID. It's just been a lot. And this on top of everything else we're facing is really, you know, we all just need to support each other. But I also am gonna to talk to him about, you, you can't ignore issues. You have to talk about it. You have to be, the kids are looking for him for guidance and so are we. So it's needed that we, we have these difficult discussions um, and reassuring the kids. Um, I also was talking to other educators and uh, before I was talking, <laughs> I said, you know, I'm invited to do this virtual march. I have no idea what I'm going to say. You know what they all said? They were worried about the media coverage. They were also talking about the need to have less media coverage, that the idea that this might be planting the seed for other people. And I really have thought about that and said, they're right. I know that I know everybody has a job to do to keep us all informed, but they're right. Like, there has to come a time where you, you there's less focus on it. And maybe that will give us a chance to get our kids back focused on the learning. Um, and they were just saying, we don't wanna continue to plant seeds for anybody else, you know, because we are we are sitting ducks in the classroom. And I'm gonna be honest with you, in the, in the school, we're targets. And I hate that the kids are thinking, is it me next? Or teachers are thinking, is it me next? Maybe a reduction in the news coverage might help as well. And I was listening very closely to the teachers and I agree, you know, we all know our jobs. We're all afraid. We don't have bulletproof vests or anything. You know, we have pencils and pens and highlighters. That's what we go to school with. And we are there to educate the students, but it's very difficult. I can tell you right now as an educator um, to teach and, and with fear. So we have to find some way to reduce that or take it away because this is gonna be very traumatizing. I hate to see my five or six year olds have that look on their face. I'm doing my best to provide an environment where they shouldn't have to worry about somebody coming into a school and shooting them. They should be smiling and laughing and enjoying their school experiences. And I gotta tell you, it's very hard right now to maintain that. I'm happy we only have a few days left, but I, I hate that this is kind of where we left the end, the end of the year at. And I'm hoping for change, like we are in need of change right now. And I can understand teachers who are leaving the profession. I for one have considered it because I'm not trained in that. I don't know what to do and I pray for the courage to know what to do in the event should I ever have to face that, but I, I understand it and I empathize with teachers and 
who feel this way. We really have to do a lot of changes. And I just hope that you guys continue to pray and continue to march and to hold events and like that. And just keep us in mind, especially the kids. That's why I'm here. I love my kids. I love my job, but change is needed. And thank you to you guys for organizing this. And sorry, still emotional, sorry. It is indeed emotional. Oh, and thank you so much, Sakina, uh, for saying those words. Are there any comments for Sakina? Um, uh, Sakina, there's a question in the chat from Elena. Wait a minute. It, uh, oh, Elena Ivanova said, did your administration, uh, I got to roll the chat back up, sorry. Uh, did your school administration do anything to deal with this disruptive kid? Hi, no, they didn't. He's, I think my principal, he has a big heart. Um, but I think he's afraid to, you know, not deal with it. I don't know. I don't know. If, but the other day we were in a meeting and um, I was telling his teacher that I'm praying for her because every day she's crying because she's tried her best. And she told me that exact moment that he threatened to kill everybody in the school. And I did not, and I told her, I said, I hate to say this because I don't label kids. I said, but I'm fearful of him carrying out this threat. And my principal keeps giving this young man chances after chances after chances. And I just want him to put his foot down and say, you know what, this is not okay. So that he learns that this is not how you deal with it. And yes, I believe that he has some challenges and some difficulties and is in need of some help. But we, when is enough is, is enough? Is it after he carries out this threat? So I, I'm worried. And, and yes, our whole school is traumatized, by the way, because the kids know that he's the one who's ripping down everything and throwing chairs. So no, they haven't done anything. And I'm just, all I'm doing is praying. Please pray with me. Thank you, Sakina. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, I invite you if you know, I um, will share the comments with you in the chat, but they're, it's really important. You know, at some point we can, you can read them. They're, they're very inspirational and supportive, you know, that um, it's also a call to action to support each other. So um, turn it over to Bev Johns. Oh, thank you, Anne. I have the pleasure of introducing a Texas colleague to you and she was just able to join us because she has been in the middle of another meeting. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Vicki Suarez who has taught music in the Texas public schools for 19 years. She is a frequent presenter at music education conferences and for teacher professional development. In the summer, Vicki enjoys teaching teachers at the Songworks Educators courses in the University of Wisconsin at River Falls and bringing music to her students and helping teachers along the way has made for a joyful career. And Vicki has just taken a position in the Dallas Public Schools. So Vicki, thank you for coordinating your schedule so you could be with us today. Thank you so much, Bev. Yes, I'm here at the Texas State Convention of Alpha Delta Kappa, and I just worked it out, <laughs> so I ran up here uh, during the luncheon, and thank you for allowing me to talk to you today about gun violence protection and gun safety. I began my public school teaching career in 1989. I have seen the gun violence trajectory over the course of my career. I'm speaking today to you as a teacher, and as a member of Moms Demand Action, that's what's on my shirt here, um, which is a grassroots movement of Americans fighting for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence. If you would like to get involved, you can text the word COMMIT to 64433 to get connected with us. And I'll put that in the chat in a little bit. And here are some of the main points I wanna bring you today. Gun violence is the leading cause of death for American children ages one to 19. Black Americans are 10 times more likely to die from gun violence than any other group. If more guns made us safer, 
we would be the safest country in the world because there are 400 million guns in America, the most per capita in the world. Our legislative priorities for this group, Moms Demand Action, are first, we are asking for background checks on all gun sales. In Texas, only federally licensed dealers have to require a background check. And even then, if it doesn't clear in three days, they can sell the gun anyway. Two, extreme risk protection order legislation which is a legal mechanism to temporarily restrict access to firearms for people who through a due process court of law procedure have been deemed a risk to themselves or others. Three, raising the age from 18 to 21 to purchase long guns. Four, secure storage requirements. And five, we in Texas would like to see a repeal of permitless carry, which we, we have now. And a huge issue right now for schools is the school safety piece. So many people have called to arm teachers and staff and there is no evidence that that would make anyone safer. 21% of Texas school districts currently arm educators and staff and have since 2007 and school shootings have only increased. To prevent tragedies, we must implement strong school safety solutions, but arming teachers is not one of them. School shootings are chaotic, and in these moments of chaos, we cannot ask teachers to stop a shooter, potentially a former student. There are good reasons why arming teachers is opposed by school safety experts, teachers, and law enforcement. First, when a gun is in the classroom, students can get access to it. There have been multiple incidents of students and teachers finding misplaced firearms in bathrooms, locker rooms, even sporting events. The notion of a highly trained teacher armed with a gun able to respond as quickly as trained law enforcement is a myth. Law enforcement officers receive hundreds of hours of training, but in states that have laws to arm school personnel, school staff receive much less training. Having access to a gun in the classroom increases the likelihood that a student will access the gun and that someone will be shot outside of an active shooter incident. Schools are places for books and backpacks, not weapons. Instead, we need proven solutions that are backed by data and that intervene before violence occurs. Another call is to increase safety resource officers on campuses. There have been safety resource officers present at every school shooting and they have not stopped the shootings from happening. More SROs isn't the answer. In over 70% of school shootings involving anyone under the age to purchase weapons, the shooter has obtained the gun from a family member or friend who did not securely store the gun. Secure storage literally saves lives. If educators want to get involved in advocating for school safety, the call is not to arm teachers or make schools like prisons. We need more school counselors and support, more emphasis on conflict resolution and emotional support in schools and secure storage requirements. Again, if you would like to get involved, please text the word commit to 64433 to get connected. Right now you can download the Demand Action app to get notifications on action items, when and how to contact lawmakers and Moms Demand Action even provides talking points. Thank you again for allowing me to speak to you today and let's, we can all do something. We can do something and let's do something to work together to make our world safer. Thank you very much, Vicki. Lots of important factual information that is greatly appreciated. Does anyone have a question for Vicki? And again, if you do, I know that you can put it in the chat and we'll, we'll make sure that it gets answered. So thank you, Vicki, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to deliver an important message. Thanks so much. Thank it you. is now my privilege to introduce uh, from the state of Illinois, a very long-term activist in so many arenas of education, and that is Dr. Vinnie Hall. 
Dr. Vinnie Hall currently serves as president of Delta Kappa Gamma Gamma Tall Nu. Uh, and she is also a professor in education at Roosevelt University in the Chicago area. Dr. Hall has served uh, for several years uh, previously on the Illinois State Board of Education, speaking up for uh, the rights of educators. And she has also served as the former president of the Illinois Council for Exceptional Children. So welcome, Vinny. Thank you so much. It's a, a real honor to be with all of you great leaders today. Well, my talk's a little different today. Um, Uvalde has a ripple effect on our notions of safety, truth, and trust. Can any of us step outside of our homes and expect to be safe? Yes. We march today toward not giving into fear. We march today to develop ways, as Mrs. Magruder suggests, to talk with our children. If you see something, say something. Our children must be protected and we must help them protect themselves. We're marching toward developing ways to talk among ourselves as adults, as our last speaker just talk, spoke, to talk about some sort of action and not continue to simply express empty rhetoric, thoughts and prayers, or just plain silence. Look at the man or woman in the mirror and let's make changes individually and collectively and vote. Help us develop neighborhood watches. Help us develop sensitive and sensible support for each other. We are marching toward developing ways to partner with our legislators who will promote, you know what Shirley Chisholm used to say, if you won't give us a seat at the table, we must bring a folding chair, but we will be there. A, when we talk with those legislators, no gun ownership without a license or without training, up to age from 18 to 21 for purchasing any firearm, no purchase of any military style weaponry. And for those that exist, they have to have special permission, licenses, registration of all ammunition and owner fingerprints. Every gun must be registered, especially the ghost guns to so the distributor of the ghost guns. All ammunition must be registered, no bump stocks, red flag laws. Budget our tax dollars, our tax dollars for mental health and more social workers in schools and places of business. All of our schools must have safety like TSA has at our airports. Someone beside the principal and teachers must be in charge of truth and safety. And as mentioned, media, adult news at discrete times a day, make at least 40% of our news based on positive and well-researched information and not 90%, if it bleeds, it leads. Focus on the victims. No name, no fame for any shooter. Second big idea is truth. There's a whole question of truth, the whole truth. What I'm getting ready to say is not popular, but like the body of Emmett Till was shown to the public with permission or stimulation or simulation. I remember I'm saying permission or stimulation. Show, show the horror of a human being being shot with a military style weapon, not just the green gym shoes. Question, are our law enforcement officers outgunned by the military style weaponry? What are marketing techniques of gun manufacturers? More transparency, we need it. Their marketing must be monitored as well as their audiences. Do we have reliable data or reliable database so we can see the trends and the pattern? 
who is keeping accurate data on the sellers of weapons or gun owners or victims or dollars involved? What training is available for law enforcement to disable shooters without necessarily killing them so we can understand the motives? And finally, trust. When and who can we rely upon relative to authority? Who is the authority? Is it the government, the media, TikTok, Twitter? We have a million people who died in the United States because some refused to believe in COVID was legitimate. We have an ongoing 40 years of bad news on television news. How do we trust ourselves and each other to tell the truth and trust each other? We know people in our country come together in times of need and disaster. Take, for example, the teacher who was killed in Uvalde and her husband who had the fatal heart attack as he was preparing for her funeral, leaving four precious children behind. Without trust and truth, we can't be safe. We are in times of need to help ourselves, our neighbors. We are a nation of we's, not I's. So let's act like it. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Questions for Vinny. I particularly like that we are we, not I. Wonderful. Wonderful messages. All right. Liz is going to introduce Anna. Thank you so much, you know, to all the speakers, to all of us sharing your comments and kind of introspecting. You know, when uh, Vicki spoke about you might be killing your former student, if armed, that, I don't know, that just struck, with, struck me, although we don't think about that, you know. So thank you, Vicki. That was powerful. So I have the honor and privilege to introduce our colleague, our friend, our person in sisterhood in Costa Rica. Anna Isabel Quesada Bodrich is an elementary school teacher and librarian with a professional experience of more than 40 years. She's currently retired. She first served at Escuela Nueva Laboratorio I majored in French, not Spanish, but I, I gave it my best shot there, at the University of Costa Rica. And after graduating as a librarian, she worked at the UNDP office in Costa Rica and served as a librarian consultant at the UNESCO sub-regional office for Central America. Finally, ultimately, she was the head librarian at Lincoln School in Costa Rica for 24 years as a member of the Costa Rican Institute of Children's and Youth Literature, she volunteered at its documentation center. So it is my privilege to welcome Anna Isabel. Thank you, thank you to all of you. I hope that you can hear me because I have a very heavy rain now, but it is an honor for me to be here with you. This is my message. The members of the Costa Rica State Organization together with our sisters from the Latin American area are deeply moved by the pain that a school, a group of families, an entire community are suffering due to the violent and unexpected events in Ovalde, Texas. We, along with the whole world, feel, feel your sorrow. We are grateful for your invitation to be part of this important march for life and peace, to join hands with you in solidarity and hope, and to raise our voices asking for more security for citizens as we reflect and exchange ideas in search of effective solutions to prevent similar tragedies in the future. Every act of violence touches our hearts and makes us think about our responsibilities as the citizens of a country 
and of these interrelated and interdependent worlds. As leading educators, we must be committed to building the global peace and justice that we long for the, in the present, and we must continue building for the future generations. This commitment moves us to search for new models of coexistence and education and to form alliances through which effective and beneficial actions can take place so that we can have a positive impact on individuals and on our entire society. We must admit that we live in a turbulent time with the strong winds of confusion, misinformation, and violence, and that we are frequently affected by emptiness and isolation, even in this midst of a large and growing world population. In Costa Rica, we are not free from these kinds of situations, even though the country has abolished our army, and has laws to control the purchase and possession of weapons. We are currently experiencing growing violence due to the criminal drug trafficking activities that have no respect for the law or established order, and which involve vulnerable youth, as we know all too well. Sadly, we have also begun to observe outbreaks of violent student fights and threat of social media of shootings at public schools. Today, we are united by the sisterhood and the inspiration that emanates from the purposes and principles of Delta Kappa Gamma, which <laughs> always move us to make our best efforts to possibly impact the world through permanent and committed action in favor of children, youth, and society as a whole. I want to end by sharing with you a few inspirational words from Robert Mueller, a distinguished and highly awarded United Nations official for more than 40 years. In, 40 years. in 1980, he and the Costa Rican President Rodrigo Carazo co-founded the University for, for Peace. He was an activist who promoted a global and spiritual civilization, who was an author with more than 14 publications that reflected his faith in God, his love and respect for life, and his vision of education as both the key for the future and as the great avenue to achieve optimal human relations. He said, the first action to achieve harmonious relationships on this planet, therefore, rest with you and me. Hence, the enlightened self-interest and imperative to be optimistic, to bring into play the miracle of faith, to release the forces of the heart and of the soul in this largest number of people. This planet, this planet was not created for international mass murder. He was not born and cut up in borders, nations, and groups. It is and has always been an interdependent planet, a complete biosphere, a sphere of life in which all human beings are sacred, irrespective of their group affiliation. I wish you the best. Let's work together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Very well, very beautifully said. Thank you very much, Anna Isabel. Um, you have such passion and inspiration and sisterhood and, and support. And she shared her comments, written comments and very inspiring. And, Certainly that last quote and passage by Robert Mueller and, and you know, sharing the support from Costa Rica with all of us is, is just so important. And as in the chat, powerful, inspiring, thank you, beautiful words um, that we have. So as we continue here, 
Um, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our colleague who is visiting Hawaii. You might have met when we came on Nancy Benz. And uh, Nancy is, uh, has been an active Florida educator, advocating on behalf of traditional public schools in Tallahassee since 2010. She's the administrator of a popular statewide Facebook page uh, called Reconstruct Ed. And they tackle the profession's difficult topics through honest and thoughtful debate. Today, she will be talking about the issue that is surfacing once again in the area of education, gun violence, and also how to use social media to spur action. So Nancy, welcome and thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Honolulu. Good afternoon to all on the eastern side. Uh, I have much to say about gun violence. Of course, I have many stories from all the advocacy work, but I'm going to minimize all the clutter that's going on in my brain right now. Congratulate all the fabulous things that are being said. I'm going to share one thing with you today, how to use social media to spur action. And to do that, I'm going to focus in on one particular page called Reconstruct Ed. Although there are other ways, I'm going to be giving tips and tricks on how to manage something like this or to join this page. There are other ways to use social media to spur action. I'm going to use Facebook today. So I'm going to go ahead and just do some screen sharing with you. Hopefully all works out well. The name of this group is called Reconstruct Ed. I'm promoting it because it works well. <laughs> For the last five years, I really worked hard to make sure that the people on this page are educators that uh, give honest feedback and I respect their words and responses. Um, the way that this page in particular started was with a rally and a march, a march that we'll be doing today. I'm doing it here in Honolulu at one o'clock. It is now 930. So we'll be, my daughter and I will be heading down there with our posters. But this is exactly how this page started. I'm on the far left side where it says protect our schools, protect our democracy. And this is where this page began. A group of legislative advocates in Martin County, Florida, got together and came up with this plan and then started this page. From that point, which was about 2015, 14, something like that, from that point on, we grew and grew. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what that is and what that page has evolved into. I wanted to say that this particular event has spurred me to move forward using our Facebook group to do a live stream. So today I'll be using the option of live stream on Facebook through Reconstruct Ad to video tape some of the march here in Honolulu. I've been educating the group on Reconstruct Ed with this video on how to make this work for them, trying to get some live streaming done back in Florida. So when I reflected back on what it takes to get action through social media, I refer, I, I did some reflection on how that, how that came about and why it's become rather successful. So when I think about the audience, the audience has evolved over this period of time. While I've not always been the main administrator of this page, I am now. And so I have the power to kind of maneuver the way that this, the, the kind of messaging that this um, page uh, um, has evolved into. So there's a number of uh, characteristics that I do expect out of those that are on the page. And it's difficult to do because it is a public a public page. So I, re I require respectful discourse, the ability to use different points of view to be inclusive. It's not just educators, it's parents and students. And I'm always looking for highlight post writers with potential. There's a few of them on here today. I have a couple of Florida educators that help me on this page. Donna Heald, Maria, you're here. I see you. And I always appreciate all the work that you do to help us keep up with the mass amount 
of Florida news when it comes to education. And then I reflected also on what made this page successful and hopefully continue to grow. One thing I've had to realize is the flexibility. I have to give over some of the control of the, of the way that this page moves along, although bo putting borders on it is also important. Integrity is a must. And we have a group of educators that demand it. If anyone puts anything on there that just doesn't um, aim to a high amount of integrity, they will point it out. Um, I read everything, and I think that's very important. I've made the mistake sometimes of just thinking that this particular post coming from this particular person is likely to, to be of high integrity. And I've learned that, no, I must, I must look at everything. And that keeps me quite busy. Um, I encourage all participants to ask questions. I encourage them to ask a question before they post their article. And I have to be ready to be wrong. That happens now and then, I try to minimize it, but it does happen now and then, and I'm ready to be wrong and be corrected by the people on this page. And I also, foremost, encourage every person on this page to get involved, advocate, and post. I have to be aware that there are always ghost visitors, people coming in and, and reading what we've written, that there are trolls that throw in comments that aren't true, that are, they're trying to for, use this page to um, get some misinformation out there. There are radicals there at all times watching and misinformation spreaders. We have to be very knowledgeable, all of us that are on this page, to ensure that anything that's posted is not being used to spread misinformation. And then another interesting thing that's happened, especially lately, is that members, members are trying to get in from foreign countries that have no reason to be in there. So I, I view a lot of profiles. I get about four or five requests every day from people from foreign countries to try to get into this page. So if you're interested in using social media to start your own take action page, here's a couple of tips that I would suggest to keep in mind as you do this. It takes time and commitment. You must keep the passion alive. Norms are very important. And like some of the other speakers have said, be fearless. Um, that just means that you, if, if you're feeling it, say it. If you're feeling it, write it with respect, of course. Keeping this page interesting and alive requires pacing and keeping the momentum going, encouraging diversity. And I'm continually, like now, recruiting people to add themselves to this page and get involved in the conversation here and to build um to build your own resources from the from the resources that we use that have already been vetted. So I would encourage you to go ahead and join Reconstruct Ed. Let's take our debate to the national stage. Thank you organizers that have put this together. You're giving us this opportunity to take this page that was primarily Florida to a national stage of debate. Consider joining. It is a Facebook public group called Reconstruct Ed. Thank you for the opportunity for letting me join in today. I'm always ready to speak on this issue. <laughs> Thank you. Very informative. Very informative. Good. Good. Bravo. So it is my pleasure now to introduce to you Lisa Caputo Love, who has been a Chicago public school teacher for 17 years. She is a published author and she is an active teacher leader. She was awarded the Chicago Foundation for Education's Teacher of the Year Award in 2018. She has been a Teach Plus Policy Fellow and Senior Fellow an adjunct professor and served on Chicago Public Schools Teacher Advisory Council. She strives to develop practical and effective solutions to obstacles in schools and to provide an equitable, 
high quality public education for her students. It has been my privilege to also work with her on the Teach to Lead project. And I am happy to announce also that she is the incoming president of Beta, Beta Alpha chapter in Chicago of Delta Kappa Gamma. Lisa, thank you for all you do. Hello, thank you very, very much for the introduction and for inviting me here today. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. You have all brought really um, wonderful comments to the conversation. Um, I just wanted to start as a teacher with some of the experiences that I have had in the classroom recently. I know that most of the people on this call um, are either educators themselves or have a strong connection to education. So I'm sure a lot of what I'm saying you've also experienced or heard of already, but I think that it's really important to talk about these experiences because in many ways, if we don't share them, um, it, it almost uh, doesn't allow everyone to really understand the full picture of the impact. So for example, when we do these drills, um, I have had conversations with colleagues. My co-teacher who is across the hall from me keeps a baseball bat in the closet right by his classroom door. Um, and when I asked him what it was for, said, well, if someone's coming in here, I'm going to go down swinging. Um, sorry, I'm going to try to <laughs> get through this um, as the other teacher shared it is very emotional. Um, I, during ha drills, have had to comfort students who start to cry and who say that they're scared as um, administrators pull on the door handle to check if we've locked the door properly while we are hiding in the corner of the room. Um, I have had to promise students that if someone tried to get in, I would drop them out the window so that they could get away. Um, and I experience daily um, as students' water bottles, those metal water bottles that they now have fall off desks and made a lot, make a loud noise um, as they hit the ground, jumping in fear. So those are kind of the things that students are living through day to day now in light of all of the things that are happening. And what do I hear in response to that from our legislators and from the media and from social media? I hear advertising on tricks of how to lock the door using a chair handle. Um, I hear about products that you can go out and buy such as bulletproof um, door uh, backpacks and and classroom items, as well as door jams that you can buy and purchase for schools to prevent doors from being open. I hear a call to arm teachers. I hear a call for metal detectors. And all I hear when I hear all these things are reactions. And I hear giving money and spending those resources on reactive, strategies that don't stop these things from happening in the first place. And so I think that also gun violence goes beyond mass shootings. Um, and we really need to invest in more prevention. And all of the things that so many of the speakers have already said in like in, for example, licensing and training people to when they have weapons, it is a responsibility. And everything else that we have, whether it's driving a big truck, you have to get training and licensing to be able to do that responsibly. And it just is beyond me that people can have access to these dangerous weapons without proper training and licensing. But in addition to that, I've done a lot of reading on the very limited um, research, which is a whole nother thing that we need to do more of, um, that's out there about that many of the shooters either had legal access or many, many, many of them got 
the weapons from their own homes. So someone else who did, an adult who was older, who had legal access, and then they broke into the safe, or they had knew where the safe keys were, or the code was. So there's so much more to do around um, besides just upping an age in terms of making sure weapons don't get into the hands of people in general. And finally, just the transparency to all around training of recognizing signs. There are signs to look for. It's not common enough knowledge of what to look for and what to do when you see those signs. And I hear so many stories of, you know, like the other teacher mentioned, where a student might say these things in schools where they, you know, are going to hurt someone. And one thing that I did read and learn a lot about is that removing or expelling a student doesn't work because they can come back into those schools with a weapon, even if they're removed or expelled. So we have to go beyond the mentality of just removing the student from the school when something like that happens. There has to be more supports and procedures in place. And we need to make sure that we spend the time and money to make those procedures well known and um, thoroughly researched and applied. And so my call to all of you today is a call to action. I think that this is a first step this March, but we, all of the people on here, the 70, 80 plus people on here, if we can reach out to, to others and urge people to call legislators and really act on all of these things, make sure that these um, take advantage of this momentum now um, that because that can really have an impact and we need to put those calls in. We cannot just say these things as you see my daughter in the background who I asked to be outside for this, um, <laughs> we need to really make sure that we are take, making those calls now and asking people who um, we know that don't agree with us, make the calls, don't avoid those conversations. I think we're too um, prone to avoid these conversations due to conflict, but we need to have these conversations with those people. These people need to know, our friends and family need to know that how the people they care about feel and how they can support um, moving together and coming together to take action and actually prevent these things from happening and not just investing in reactive activities. Thank you very much. Very good, very well. Thank you, Lisa. Important messages for us from the classroom um, and the, the real world of the classrooms and a call to being proactive as opposed to reactive uh, and having the courageous conversations about this very difficult topic. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, and, and, and thank you so much, Lisa. I just wanted to write on there, you know, let's do what Lisa says. <laughs> and let's just have that call to action and a lot of good suggestions. I can't wait to go through all the comments and pull out and, and great ideas uh, that someone mentioned about, you know, getting this out, you know, testimonies, written stories about them. It, particularly what resonates with me is, you know, as a classroom teacher, you know, back in the mid 70s and 80s and back when I was in school was, I think someone mentioned getting under desk. I just can't imagine, you know, with having your own children in school and you, but thank you very much. So, so we're going, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Vivian Posey. Uh, and she comes from the Florida State Organization also. Um, and she is the state legislator. Uh, I'm sorry, the state, I wish you were a state legislator. <laughs> the state legislative chair in uh, Florida and has so much experience in this area. I, um, Vivian and I had the opportunity to work with some others and a, a kind of an idea we had about women in politics and you know, women to run and educators to run. You know, we wanted educators to run and women educators to run. And so she has participated in so many lobby days with the rally and tally. Um, I know she's a former principal and 
presently teaches students who are going to be teachers and how do you can how do you deal with that when you're teaching you know students to be teachers with the atmosphere that's going on so it's my sheer delight to welcome and thank you Vivian for being with us today thank you Liz <clears throat> and and thank you for the invitation to speak my goodness what an honor to be with this esteemed group um, it's really truly a pleasure I bring you greetings from Banff Springs, Canada. Um, we are on a very long awaited vacation um, to this beautiful part of the world. And um, I must say that my involvement with the virtual event came um, as we were all experiencing such pain and anguish after the Buffalo event. And then um, of course the tragic events in Uvalde. Um, it, I almost feel guilty, I have to tell you, um, going on vacation at this time because I feel as if um, there is just so much to be done um, to help change the, the way we live in the U.S. And so um, we did come on vacation, but I want to share with you just uh, some insights in just uh, the week or so that we've been here. Uh, one of the things that I noticed just in coming through the airport um, was the calm um, of, of all of what had to be done to get enormous amounts of visitors into the country. And, um, and it was done in such a professional manner. But one of the things that struck me were signs throughout the airport of how in Canada, we are all united um, to be a place of, of safety and of security and um, uh, and and the, for the good of everyone in our country. And I thought we could use more of that in the US right now. And it doesn't hurt to remind people of that every once in a while. We bemoan the fact often that we are so separated, but I'm not sure we're doing enough to, to find ways to bring us together. And so that was just one small way that I thought maybe we could take that back to the US. Um, I, I, I want to be sure that I'm not repeating uh, messages from the very, very wonderful speakers have already spoken. So my messages are a, a, um, a bit scattered, but I'll do my best to bring some cohesion to them. As Liz mentioned, I am a longtime educator, um, teacher and curriculum specialist and principal uh, and teacher of teachers and now teacher of uh, aspiring school principals. So we have seen education change in uh, over the course of the years that I've been in education. I can remember worrying about um, with children who in schools when I was a principal um, who had severe behavioral and emotional uh, challenges. Um, and, and we worried a bit, uh, worried so much about them. We also had difficult families and difficult parents. And, and of course, we always worried um, that when they would come to school that things would be unpleasant. Um, but I never worried that they would be carrying a lethal weapon. And so my heart just breaks for those of you who are still in the classroom, who have to feel that in spite of all that we know and that all that we are doing, there are ways that um, these terrible things can still happen. So in 2018, my husband and I were living very close to the Parkland um, area when that tragedy struck. And we marched um, with the students in Parkland um, on one occasion, a huge march. We listened to the parents um, of some of the students who had been taken in that event um, and the tragic stories that they told and the heartbreak. And, and also listened to the student leaders who are still working on this now, uh, even after this many years. And we thought this would change everything. So Florida took some actions really uh, to make our students safer, um, to harden schools, to make schools impenetrable. And yes, those things have happened um, and, and teachers do feel safer, um, but we've still got a long way to go across the US. In speaking with some of the Canadians who are on this trip with us, they clearly look at us with um, that question in their eyes, what is happening to our brothers and sisters in the US? What is going on? They just clearly do not understand this. 
and and we don't certainly don't want to ruin anyone's vacation by getting into these deep conversations but i think before we leave i am going to engage some of them that i've come to know um, a little bit more deeply um, i have a little more courage you know after listening to some of you who have spoken that way and i do agree that sometimes we avoid it and we shouldn't so let me just mention a couple of the things that have come to mind since this all occurred one of the uh, reasons that I joined the virtual teachers lounge event a couple of weeks ago was because I was concerned that I saw no position statement coming from DKG um, expressing concern and um, solidarity with teachers uh, in Texas. And um, I was somewhat disconcerted about that. I've been getting messages from other educational groups in my email um, with some very, very uh, uh, comforting comments. And I felt that DKG certainly needed to be among that group. Um, I, I want to remind everyone that protection from uh, gun violence should not be a political statement. So when we are carrying these messages forward, we should consider ourselves as still being a nonpartisan um, safety for all should not be a political issue. Um, we are an international organization. We know there have been mass shootings in Australia and Sweden. So as a member of DKG, I want to feel as if this organization is going to make a strong statement and join those of you who are just being so eloquent with your outrage at where we are. Um, there's a wonderful quote from Desmond Tutu that I want to remind everyone of. I know you have heard this. Um, if we are neutral, then we are on the side of the oppressor. And right now, we must consider the gun industry as our oppressor. They are keeping us in fear of our lives. They are impacting our quality of life. And they are a minority. And we cannot rule by minority. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is due to all of us. Um, especially those of us who are in the majority. And so we have to say, stop, we cannot go any longer and having this continue. So remember that this is not just a matter of school safety, but it's all of our public spaces. It's just that our school safety issues uh, affect us so much emotionally. We must remember that we have to hold the gun industry accountable. Think back to what happened with the tobacco industry. Smoking is no longer normal in this country, although we still worry that it, it is increasing. But there is a culture of no smoking. We need to recreate that and, and know that we can create in this country a culture of no gun access. That's where we need to be. Not some, not a little, not a percentage, but none. We need to follow the money of this gun industry. And remember, they are a minority. We should demand that there are no assault weapons to be purchased for personal use. What do we need assault weapons for in our personal lives? Only because we're afraid of one another. Now, that's what we're, that's the difference. We're not afraid of one another in Canada. We don't fear our neighbors, but we have been convinced that we have to be fearful of our neighbors in the U.S., Let's track that back to where that may have started with the gun industry itself. We have to think of this as a public health problem, but it is a preventable public health problem. We need to change our thinking. Don't normalize guns to kill innocent people. We can't let ourselves feel as if this is normal because it is not. We are experiencing a very difficult time in the U.S., and we need to say we cannot have this continue any longer. We've been hearing that this is due to not enough mental health services. I would like to suggest that, and I know you've heard this, our percentage of, of citizens in need of support for mental health issues is not greater than in other countries. But I would tell you that now, since we have been living, as you, our teachers have mentioned, in this era of, of gun violence in schools, we now need trauma prevention and trauma support, as um, the earlier speakers mentioned, because now we have moved from mental health needs to actually 
supporting trauma-informed schools. And by not understanding the roots of trauma, we will never understand the, uh, the, the disastrous um, effects of having access to these lethal weapons in our country. I read a wonderful book by Bruce Perry called What Happened to You. Instead of uh, seeing a child um, who is creating havoc in a school as what's wrong with that child, we need to dig back and find out what happened to this child because often that behavior is determined by previous trauma in the developmental stages uh, of, their, um, of their lives. We need to continue to fund research as someone who shared recently about gun violence prevention. Remember that for many years, we um, as a nation had laws against funding gun violence uh, research. It's starting to flow now, but we've got a long way to go to catch up and make sure that we know what we can do with good, strong, uh, credible research on how we can prevent future um, incidents of this. Finally, I'd like to just leave you with uh, going back to the action steps that we talked about before. We are a very strong and a very large organization. I'm proud to be a DKG member. I'm proud of the work of all of these very, very eloquent speakers today. My heart is just breaking for the messages of our teachers, but we need to think about DKG internationally as being a leader in, in making strong statements uh, about uh, our reaction as an organization and helping to make this stop in this country. We can do this. We can change the culture. We have the strength and the power in our organization to do this. And finally, I'd like to just thank our teachers. As the chair of the State Legislative Committee for Florida, we are working diligently this summer on our legislative agenda to bring to our elected representatives in the fall. And I hope Hopefully you will not mind if we use some of your stories to help send that message to them because your stories are powerful and they need to hear this. It's uncomfortable, um, but it could be their family members or someone they know in the future. And so your stories are just so, so heartbreaking. Um, but I thank you if you don't mind sharing those with us. Thank you again to Liz and to Bev and for Carol for organizing this and for giving us a chance um, to share our thoughts um, and, and our pledges to really continue the action that, that we've started. I'll sign off for now from Canada. And again, thank you all for asking me to join you today. Thank you. Thank you. So many good, excellent. Oh my, Vivian. Maybe it wasn't a slip of the tongue to say I'd like you to introduce you to the state legislator. <laughs> oh, Vivian, lots. I can't wait to listen to all this and capture, you know, these just oh, just the comments. You're making many wonderful points as for all of you. And um, Nancy, Vivian, you represent Florida well. That's Thank that's you. very Thank nice you thing. very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um Turn it over to Carol. He's going to introduce our next speaker. And then after that, we have Linda McCrary and Pat Neal, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Liz. It's my pleasure again to this time introduce Cynthia Moore. Cindy is a DKG member living in Kimberley, British Columbia, Canada. She's a member of Beta Calgary Chapter in Alberta State Organization. Cindy has extensive experience in education with more than 25 years as an educator at all levels, primary, middle level, secondary, and post-secondary in arts education, educational administration, and international education, while engaging with students who have been challenged in the educational system and who flourish in a creative learning environment. In 1997, Cindy received the Canadian Teachers Federation Roy C. Hill Award for Excellence in Education. Thank you for joining us, Cindy. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Carol. <clears throat> I'm honored to be here with you actually today at this virtual march for our lives. Um, and a very special thank you to Bev and Liz and Carol <laughs> for your leadership and for the invitation and support leading up to today. 
I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I'm going to mention it to the today. I was born and raised in Canada. Oh, and by the way, Vivian, we're three hours away from one another. So I just live <laughs> on the other side of the Rockies and I'm three hours away and uh, it's on my way to Calgary to my chapter meetings. So Banff, that little town of Banff. So um, I just would like to clarify something and I know it came up in my thoughts as I was coming forward um, to think about what to say today. And, and particularly, I want to mention to you, my first year teaching high school, 1985, about two months in, I had a break and a student was in the hallway right outside my classroom and I had no idea what he was doing. I know he was a 10th grader and uh, he was in one of my classes. I walked to his locker. He was putting a handgun into the locker. So I'll tell you, this happens. And uh, fortunately, for my father, Albert Moore, and who had, uh, I mean, I had actually used uh, firearms as a, as, a, as a younger girl. Um, I had seen him clean his guns and do them and lock them up and care for them. I am now actually, uh, since moving to British Columbia, I have my, I have my firearm license. So I took the course and um, I thought I'd be the oldest person in the course. There was a grandma and a grandpa that were in it as well, <laughs> and uh, mostly men. So I did whether a woman was an older grandmother who wanted to actually go out with her grandson. So other than that, I just want to tell you in Canada, we're not immune to this and we've had mass shootings and they continue to build. And I, I don't want to make it sound any better, but what I want to share with you is this is a global issue. And so I've decided to take the, the perspective of, first of all, it came from Danielle Green. Uh, she was recipient of the, SB Pat Tillman Award for Service in 2015. And she asked the question after serving in the military and losing an arm. And she was a former NCAA um, female athlete, basketball athlete. So she asked, the, What is my purpose? What is my passion? And what do I want my legacy to be? And so my purpose, passion, and legacy are all wrapped into one. And you already, Carol already shared it with you engaging with students who are challenged in the educational system and um, who flourish in a creative learning environment. So today my students and I continue to lead together in learning and we are all in this together um, in peaceful times and in stressful, horrific times. So today we're marching together in our world and we're all in it together. So while reflecting on the horrific events in our world and especially Uvalde, Texas, I find myself realizing one thing, that women and children, but women especially, are disproportionately victims of violence. It's important for us to use our voices as women educators to address this cycle of violence. BC, and I decided to look up the BC government's position on violence against women is a human rights issue that affects everyone, a systemic Canadian and global problem, and the shooters are 100% responsible. This violence knows no borders. I don't have the answer to the biggest questions that we're asking today, how do we end this violence? But in education, we are aware that 80% of educators are women and 30% of women are the decision makers. Potential leaders are everywhere and they're joining us today. We are all leaders. Brenny Brown, author and educator, defines a leader in Dare to Lead, now an interesting title as we're speaking today. Anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. Our leaders are everywhere in our homes, our schools, classrooms, communities, faculty meetings, and at virtual marches. Now, women in leadership, what's it like out there? I'll give you some Stats Canada information, first of all. Vivian, I hope this doesn't burst your bubble a lot about Canada, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> out of the top 500 companies and organizations in Canada, 109, have no women on their boards of directors. 
Although 82% of women are aged 25 to 54 now are participating in our workforce, women are still underrepresented in leadership roles. Women only hold 25% of vice president positions and 15% of CEO positions in Canada. Women are 30% more like, less likely to get promoted uh, out of an entry level position and that includes educators and 60% less likely to move from middle management to the executive ranks. Now shift to the US here. While six out of 10 professional women in the US aspire to be leader in their company or organization, the same number. Six out of 10 find it hard to see themselves as leaders, right? And so we talk about it in DKG all the time, right? We're talking about that. So if only 60%, not six out of 10 and maybe less. So now on Back to Canada, a 2017 KPMG Canada report revealed, and this is good, 60%, 7% of women reported they learned the most important lessons about leadership from other women. 82% of professional women working believe access to and networking with female leaders help them professionally. 86% of women report that they see more women in leadership they are encouraged to get there themselves. And 91%, these are Canadian women, indicated it's important to them to be a positive role model for younger female colleagues. So the virtual march for our lives. And now here we are together in this virtual march, leading women educators, impacting education worldwide. This virtual room is filled with current and future leaders, Vivian and Liz and everyone else we've heard today so far. Um, let me hear you all, see you all. Uh, Lisa, Nancy, Viv Vinny, uh, Anna, Vicky. I've, no, that's since I've come on. So I know there's more of you out there. Um, and this woman may be, and, and we're willing to lead forward with courage. And this woman may be you. Priya Parker, the author of Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters, uh, tells us her lens on gathering places people and what happens between them at the center of every com coming together, every gathering. And the first step is meaningfully bringing people together is committing to a bold, sharp purpose. We need to design for what we want, just like today, marching for our lives. So Parker has also said, when we gather for a purpose, it's our responsibility to put the right people in a room or a Zoom, like today, and help them collectively think, dream, argue, heal, envision, and I've heard this already, trust and connect for a specific larger purpose. Well, them, uh, while helping them experience a sense of belonging, a true sense of, and I've heard this already too, making connections. So every time we're brought together, she continues, we are brought into the opportunity to help one another do what we couldn't do or think of or heal alone. So often we gather in ways that hide our need for help to portray ourselves in the strongest, least heart stirring light in protection mode. So do I stay where I am in fear or move forward with love? If you love professional and personal growth to unite, to honor, to advance and inform members and educators, the answer is move forward with love, love of learning and love of growing. Brenny Brown reminds us that courage is contagious. Every time we're resilient and choose courage, we make everyone around us a little better and the world a little braver. When women are open and brave in the face of current change, which is what we're going through, right? And we focus on learning and skill building, anything is possible. So now the challenge. I'm challenging all of you to use your voice, and your courage to become leaders and decision makers. Yes, Liz, yes, Dr. Vivian Posey, educators to run. I've heard of that organization and I love it. And that <laughs> needs to happen. As 
And so I'm challenging to use your voice and your courage to become leaders as you leave this virtual march and go back into the world today. So I have, there's four questions here. What have you experienced? How are you feeling? What are you excited about? And the most important, what are you going to share with educators, friends, and DKG members who are not here today? Talk to someone about it. I'm gonna end with a, a, a little special something from the music world. Adele Adkins, sing, British singer and songwriter in her song, To Be Loved, tells us, it's about time I face myself. I'll never learn if I never leap. I'll always yearn if I never speak. Let it be known that I tried. <laughs> Bravo, wonderful, so motivational for us, just wonderful, wonderful. And there are many people are saying great message. So thank you, Cindy, because I know you've had a very busy day today. <laughs> and she ain't yeah. even with us. Uh, I, let's see, am I on mute or not? There, I always have to keep that in. Thank you, Cindy. As you're speaking and challenging us and using voice and courage, it just occurred to me that every single member here and in their organization receives the collegial. Wouldn't it be great if we got everybody's comments and had a special edition of something and send to everybody, you know, or the video or video clips. So that's just mine and, and move forward with love. Um, absolutely, thank you. So. So um, to continue, we want to listen to our final two speakers who were with us today, uh, Linda McCrary and then later Pat Neal. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, to introduce Linda to you. And may I share with you that we asked the um, presenters, you know, to give us a bio sketch and a blurb. A, of something they've had. So, so this is probably, you know, from their air true selves to their true selves and what we know. So Linda McCrary served the Macon County, Tennessee school system for 37 years as a secondary science teacher and library media specialist. She retired in 2000, battled breast cancer in 2001, served her state retired teacher association in 2013, 2014, in 2016, she was elected to the NEA Retired Executive Council, where she chairs the Governance Committee to craft proposed changes to governing documents. She's a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. And I am so proud and delighted to welcome Linda as she shares her remarks with us. Over to you, Linda. Thank you, Liz. I'm honored to join this group today. I've been amazed at the information that's been shared. It's been heartwarming. It's been challenging. It's been emotional. It's been everything that it should have been and so much more than we normally hear. I thank you and Beth and Carol for organizing this march and for giving me the opportunity to participate. I'll begin my remarks by sharing a few key facts that are absolutely horrific. There have been at least 2,654 shootings since Sandy Hook mass shootings since Sandy Hook, with at least 2,908 killed and 11,088 wounded. As was stated earlier, gun violence is a public health crisis. Gun violence is pervasive in the lives of adolescents who were born in the United States cities, and it affects poor and adolescents of color 
at higher rates than higher income or white adolescents. Close to half, close to half of poor black adolescents and one third of poor Hispanic adolescents were exposed to deadly gun violence compared to 2%, 2% of middle to high income white adolescents. 14 million students attend schools with police officers, but they don't have a counselor. They don't have a nurse, nor a psychologist, nor a social worker. Those are horrific facts. Every student in America, black, brown, white, native, newcomer, whatever you are, you deserve a welcoming and safe learning environment, free from fear of gun violence in your school or community. You want, you want to mute? Our yeah. students are too important to let a few politicians block solutions that the vast majority oh, yeah. of us favor. <laughs> Those politicians hope that if we fear each other, we will look the other way while they do untold damage to our communities. Someone reminded us today, vote. I agree, vote. Congress can save, can act to save lives and keep our students and educators safe by addressing gun violence nationwide and providing our schools the resources we need to foster the safe and welcoming learning environment our students deserve. NEA members are joining together with students and parents to demand what our families need so that every student across race and place in every corner of every state has the freedom to thrive and pursue their dreams. No exceptions, no exceptions. And as we think about all of this, and it becomes a long fight because let's be honest, it has already been a long fight and if we lose focus in the fight, I hope we visualize those children crawling under their desks and smearing themselves with their friend's blood to survive. Children aren't supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be having fun and learning and doing reading and writing and arithmetic, not trying to survive, I'm sorry. Following the Uvalde shooting, Becky Pringle, president of NEA, made the following statements. Uh, could we please show Becky's video at this time? Liz, you may want to just share the link with all of us so we can. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that may be best, but thank you so much for trying. I would extend an invitation to join NEA in demanding gun violence prevention laws to protect our children, educators, and communities. The NEA will be taking action across the country our nation's educators are sick and tired of our students being targeted, so join us. You can do that by texting now. Let me see if I can show this. I'm not sure I can. I can't show it. Text now to 48744 and get plugged into our movement for safe,
quality schools and communities. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Linda. And my apologies, I was back up to the backup and then I was looking for share video sound and then it, and Nicole share, but we'll put the link in it now. Did you want to put the link in, Linda? You want me to put the copy the link and put in? If you'll just copy the link and put in and, and I'll uh, put the uh, text now to 48744 to join NEA. Okay. In the chat. All righty. Thank you very much. You're Excellent. Welcome. Yes. Thank you so much, Linda. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess turn it over to you, Carol. Yes, thank you. Closing speaker. Thank you so much. It is an honor to introduce Pat Neal. Pat is the coordinator at large for the National Education Association Women's Caucus a lifetime member of National Education Association and Virginia Education Association, member of the District of Columbia and Prince George's County African American Historical and Genealogical Societies, and a member of the Education Committee of the Prince George's County Lynching Memorial Committee. Pat educates the community with presentations on lynching victims in Prince George's County, Maryland, book chats and webinars. Pat taught in the DC public schools. Later, she served as a teacher and school counselor and also the director of student services in the Fairfax, Virginia public school system. Pat, welcome. Thank you so much, Liz and Carol. And what I wanna say is enough is enough. And we've said that over and over again, NEA and AFT have promoted that. And one of the presidents of NEA and the Virginia Education Association, Mary Hatwood Cottrell in the 90s, she was an activist and she always would say it all about conventions. If I am not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, then what am I? And if not now, then when? And I think as we look at these shootings, it's a call to action. And one of the things some educators did um, Akina Magruder, teacher, myself, Ed Wayne, who's a psychologist, and Karen Gross, who's an author and educator, past uh, president of a university. We formed what we call the Virtual Teachers Lounge. And we have done this since the pandemic because so many teachers were hurting, so many teachers we felt needed to hear how to deal with the trauma that we were all going through. Karen did numerous uh, webinars on trauma and the signs and symptoms and how to cope with them in the classroom. We have been hosting the Virtual Teachers Lounge uh, fall session as a facilitator and one of them, we do six sessions starting in September, twice a month. And in the, fall, in the spring, February, March, we do another six sessions twice a month. It's free. It's open to any teacher, educator. We discuss issues. It's a place like at school, you go to the teacher's lounge and you share your thoughts with others. We want you to come and listen to others to share what's going on in your classroom or share what's happening in education, share ideas and resources. We give strategies. We are like a support group and we feel the teachers really need someone to hear them. And so that's what we've been doing over the last year with the Virtual Teachers Lounge. And we hope that if you're interested, you would join. I think if Sakina is still on one of our facilities, she can put the link in the chat and you can let us know and we will send out the link to you when we start up for the fall. We have given several seminars on how to reopen school on trauma for educators within DKG and all over. And we invite others to join us. I'm very passionate about being a member, one of the facilitators for um, virtual teachers lounge, which you call VTL. We also have a hotline that we have uh, on Wednesdays, at least once or twice a month at six o'clock. So teachers can call in and share what's on their mind. And we have found a lot of the new classroom teachers in years one through five, new administrators, they need to be able to have someone to talk to, other educators to listen to them, to share their concerns. They feel like they're out there all by themselves. And so, as we go through 
trying to unite together. You know, I encourage you to join different groups, to find an outlet, to take care of your mental health and to self-care. As an educator, you need to do everything you can to keep yourself healthy so that you can help others. Uh, Representative Robin Kelly just announced recently that her bill to prevent gun violence trafficking act passed the house on thursday this past thursday june 9th and it was part of the protecting our kids act and i'm in the washington dc area and this area we have a lot of gun violence and one of the teachers um, asked the students to write an end of the year essay and about half of her class wrote about gun violence a lot of the kids in the district have been traumatized since birth because they have gun shootings outside their schools. They have gun shootings in their neighborhoods, gun um, bullets coming through the walls of their apartments. Uh, so many of their friends have been killed. And one school, they have formed what they call a um, Pathways to Power. And a group of high school students painted a mirror on the wall in the community to show uh, where high school students have been killed just within the last year. And they put their names up and they put a little diagram to show where in the part of the city those students have been killed. They go around and talk to students at different high schools about how to join in anti-violence uh, activities, how they can talk about ways to curb the violence in their neighborhoods. And so I think for teachers, where do teachers go to talk about this? We don't have many avenues. And so the Virtual Teachers Lounge is one place where you can come and share what's on your mind, share what you're thinking, and try to find strategies and things to help keep you safe and to keep your students safe. As Sakina expressed very eloquently as a classroom teacher, that she is in the classroom every day with her students and trying to keep them safe and herself safe. And um, Arthur Fletcher of the United Negro College Fund used to say, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Um, and we think about that when we look at what's happening in our schools. We want children to be able to learn. We want to be able to teach. And we don't want to waste time dealing with other things. We're not to be there to deal with guns. We want to be there to teach the kids, to make them feel safe, and to build their self-esteem. And I think the most important job a teacher can do is to help a child feel safe, to help a child feel that someone cares about them and someone cares about their future. And so what we do today, we must do for the children of tomorrow. And I think being a part of a lobby group to lobby your parents, your Congress people, that we have to keep speaking out until someone hears our voice and listens to what we have to say. And so I like to end with um, a quote that one of the editors wrote when he was in school and some of you pledging and you went through different groups. And there used to be a phrase you were saying, when you talk to legislators or people who are not listening to you and they give you an excuse because all we're getting are excuses, maybe you can quote back to them. Excuses are monuments of nothing that build bridges that lead to nowhere. Those who use these tools of incompetence are matters or masters of nothing. And so what we have to do is to try to make sure our voice is heard. We want to thank you for coming today and we hope that you will be actively involved and talking to those who can help us make a change. Thank you. Back to you, Liz. Uh, wow, wow. So we've heard 11 speakers, had numerous comments in the chat, you know, with action steps. We have a poem that we Definitely hope you read carefully. I was going to suggest maybe reading that, but I know we're over time. Uh, so there's just a lot of good information. So what are our next steps? Uh, Cindy issued challenges to all of us. People shared about going back to their chapters and states and publishing this and doing video clips for legislators and 
all of these are certainly so powerful and I hope maybe we can divvy it up and have different uh, groups to work on that. But it would be grateful, you know, if you have a closing comment um, to write in the chat, you know, just like as we bring our circle of, you know, uh, sharing to then and making connections and we've had connections from Costa Rica, Canada, you know, many states, uh, many different, you know, uh, professional levels of an education um, group. So absolutely, we have you, your emails, but um, one of the things their promise is, we'll make sure we follow up with the information you ask, you know, take the relevant things from the chat. Um, maybe we sh you know, can do a follow one. It has been, um, we started doing these webinars a year or so ago, people were talking about them and on Facebook. And so we said, let's just start this. But We've had a lot of follow-up discussions, so maybe another follow-up discussion to see, you know, kind of a check-in in a month or so to see what's taking place. So um, thank you all for coming, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Carol and um, Beverly for some closing comments. Oh, thank you all. It's um, been difficult, challenging, and inspirational. Um, from our speakers and comments in the chats as well. We've uh, definitely hit a mark with this and hopefully you've all been inspired to take some action. Um, call your legislators, go visit them, email them, write them letters, harass them. Um, be vigilant, persistent and specific about what you have to say, what you want, what action. They need guidance on action. They're too complacent, but with specifics, they will be more reactive and they do appreciate actually hearing from us. So use all the tools you have to use your voice, individually, collectively, whatever moves you most, but please, contact them. And thank you so much for joining us today. And to yeah. echo what Carol has said, our voice must be heard. Contact a legislator or a state or local school board member or write an op-ed piece for your local newspaper. Have the courage to move forward with truth, truth, hope, and love. Okay, and it's kind of interesting. I don't think I wore this t-shirt today. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of like synchronicity all over. So Cindy said it, a lot of you said it, and um, Isabel, and Isabel said it. So here it is, more love. Let me move forward with love, must, must and more. <laughs> and one more comment was asked, what is our purpose? Karen Gross commented, what is our purpose? What could be more important than ensuring that the next generation survives and thrives? Right, and I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you who took from your valuable time to be with us this afternoon and to our speakers who have clearly motivated us with all powerful messages. Uh, we appreciate your time and we know we can all accomplish a great deal if we all work together. So thank you for taking this step to work together. And so let's all um, get on video, you know, on camera, and we want to take some screenshots and you can share your signs and you can put the signs down. So we have three or four, uh, we have three or four galleries, I think. So let's make sure we get them. If you, you know, just, so I think, is everybody on video? Um, okay, and share your signs, wonderful. And we'll do, keep keep sharing and <laughs> taking screenshots or if you're taking photos. So I have the second one to do. Oh wow. 
Oh my, these are so wonderful. Oh my, you can see them too. Yeah, take a picture and send to us. We want to do a collage. So that's our second gallery. And our third one. Oh my. Oh goodness. Oh my. Okay. I, I have to I have to stay focused on taking pictures. These are wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And so if you send a photo, we're going to put a collage of all of them and we'll put them on our Facebook page. And we have maybe like 10 or 12 signs. So if you just take a picture and send it, Carol's been collecting them. So we'll yes. do that and we'll do a summary and take the action steps that we have. So with that, it's 437. I know that we said 230 to 4, but we are riveted in place, ready to go. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so that was a you all. <laughs> Wonderful presentations. God bless DKG. If you have any other comments, we're still recording. <laughs> so. yes. Well, thank you, Liz and Carol and um, Bev, one more time. I want to thank you so much for inviting, for your invitation and for, wow, taking leadership in this regard. And um, yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Wonderful. You were, you were very, phenomenal. very wonderful. <laughs> well, Good. thank you so much for joining us. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I was just thanking the members of the District of Columbia State Organization who attended today. Yes. Appreciate yes. their support. Uh -huh. And for all the DK mm -hmm. members from all over. And, and you were three out of the 11 presenters. <laughs> 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 we had to have the virtual lounge folks on here. <laughs> so. That's right. I mean, that it started in that meeting that uh, Vivian referenced, remember? We came, we talked about them, and he said, let's do it virtually. So we and we can make things happen. DKG fix can. That's what's important. Right. And we need to write about it because we're probably one of the few that did a virtual march. So we need to let people know we're taking action. If we weren't there in person, then we Yeah, I think for me, I'm all in on that, Pat. Mm -hmm. I mean, just reading the comments, I'm so moved. I probably could get teary off <laughs> if somebody <laughs> says the right word. <laughs> And I, I want to thank you all for organizing this event event and using technology uh, to yeah. bring us all together. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at all isn't, the countries and all the states. That was exciting, wasn't it, Maria? Oh, it yeah. was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's so interesting to listen to the voices of people that cover all these states and countries, you know. So I don't, I don't think we could have this experience always in person. No, you couldn't. Not to bring all these people together. No, from the all different time zones. That's going to be our article. <laughs> Bev and Carol, we're going to get that done by August first <laughs> for collegial. Um, so thank you, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to meet you, Maria, thank you. Thank and everybody you. too. So and. On to the next webinar, maybe proposed amendments. <laughs> I believe so. I believe yes. so. Uh -huh. <laughs>